What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Smoking Tire Podcast. Today's episode is brought to you by Off the Record. We love Off the Record. They are the best. I, every week, I get at least one or two emails from somebody who used Off the Record, got them out of a little jam. You know what I mean? That last week, we had one of our Patreon members send me uh, send us a note that he used off the, rec- off the Record, and it was a very successful mission. Off the Record is a service that sets you up with a qualified attorney in the event that you get a moving violation. Could be a small one, could be a big one. The point is, you shouldn't plead guilty, you should get Off the Record. Go to offtherecord.com slash TST, or download the Off the Record app and use code T-S-T-P-O-D. That's T-S-T-P-O-D. Get you 10% off all legal services with Off the Record. Man, don't plead guilty. Get that app. Use our code. Have it in your pocket. Have it ready to go. That way, if you get pulled over, you're not going to freak out. You don't have to argue with the cop on the side of the road. You just call Off the Record, and they get you sorted. Go to offtherecord.com slash TST or code TST pod on the off the record app. All right, guys, in this episode, Zach and I are rolling southbound to Laguna Beach or Newport beaches, actually, in the Bentley. And uh, we thought it would be a good time to uh, do a little traffic podcasting. Uh, We're talking about all the new hyper cars and resto modded cars we saw at the Quail. Uh, I review the McLaren Artura versus the 750S uh, for a road trip because I traded cars halfway through my Pebble Beach trip from one to the other. Uh, We saw the most ridiculous cars driving around Monterey. Such a crazy place to be. And we talk about the best free or cheap things to do during car week plus a little teaser about a car I bought myself. It's a road show on the Smoking Tire Podcast. Right. Deep carpet, like, doesn't make sense conceptually, but it does but it feel does. nice. It's yeah, optional. it does feel nice. It's also, according to Charlie Agapu, a wear item. I believe and that. And originally you're supposed to replace those mats every 10,000 miles. Yeah. Which doesn't surprise me at all. Mm-mm. Uh... Do you want to know how much they cost? <laughs> yeah, definitely. They are fifteen hundred dollars <laughs> from Bentley, I assume. Yeah, yeah. but if you go to the Fabric District, I could probably have could... the Habibis remake. Yes. Yeah, but it is yeah. nice. Let me it just say, nice. there's no WeatherTech version. No, definitely not. We almost we were fucking this close to having a shoes off car. Yeah, I, I get mean, it. <laughs> I kind of want to take my shoes off, even it's, though shoes are sh- in I here. mean, you should because it's a delight. It's like, um, it's like uh, Die Hard, where you scrunch your feet in the carpet and, yeah. and it gets rid of jet lag. Yes. I feel like this it's, would solve that problem. It, it's Driving this car barefoot is really, really nice. Uh, so, hello, everybody, and welcome to my Bentley, the 91 Turbo R. Zach and I are on the way to uh, a, a Volvo press launch in Newport Beach, uh, the electric Volvo e, EX90. And uh, we are driving there, and uh, we thought it would be high time for Bent- those will move, yeah, yeah. for Bentleying, um, really to calibrate ourselves for luxury vehicles, and uh, because there's no time like the present to do some podcasting, here we are. So this will be our our post Pebble Beach show, right? And this is a very fitting car. It is for like winding down from Pebble Beach. I would take this. I, Hannah said that next year, if we go back, we should take this. To totally, Pebble. it's a this great, would be a great Pebble Beach car. How does it do in stop and go traffic? Perfectly fine. Great. Yeah, it's great. That's what you need there. Perfectly fine. It is the most expensive parking lot, but uh, it's really fun. I mean, it, this has been Hannah's daily driver for seven months now, and we have done two thousand eight hundred miles on it which should tell you how it is in stop and go traffic because six months of daily driving being 2,800 miles right. is LA traffic. Yeah. And that's where this car is driven. We've, we've only taken it on one road trip and that was a short one. That was Palm Springs. Yeah, so, for, for normal people, I think six months is like 6,000 miles, right? So. Yeah, I mean, in, but in, in LA, you know, the average speed of travel is 18 miles an hour. So well, here we measure it like airplanes. It's hours, engine hours, you know, engine right. hours, or there's, like a detective's car. There's probably an engine hours counter on this car <laughs> somewhere. Um, <laughs> yeah, 
But, okay, so, you know, we came back from Pebble. Uh, you were up there briefly. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was up there for the whole, the whole deal. And I had some, I had a few thoughts uh, for this podcast. I, I, I want to talk about my, my McLaren experience because I had a back-to-back with the Artura and the yeah. 750S. Um, but I also first wanted to talk about, because you came to the Quail, uh, you didn't get the full day, but our thought, our, our, a brief couple of thoughts on some of the, the supercar launches uh, that happened at the Quail. Because the Quail is now sort of like an auto show for uh, supercars. It's, it's Geneva, oh, wow. sort of. I mean, it kind of, or it's taken that role, I guess. You know, I mean, now that that, that, what's up? It wants me to do some weird thing. Oh. All right, Century, hang on. Just want you to get off Imperial, and get back on again. Oh, wow. It wants me to do all of this real crazy stuff to get on the 110. I'm I tempted think, to not do that. I think we gamble and we stay carpooling. Stay carpooling. I think we have, we have time. Okay, well, yeah, it wants me to make like 75 turns between here and the 110 freeway, and I'm going to not do no, that. it's still moving up there. I am. Uh, yeah, that this, is literally called short-sightedness. This may bite part. us, but we're, yeah. we're podcasting, so whatever. Uh, that's more important. So, let's see. New... Well, is this, is this yeah. like the premier unveiling of hypercars now? Well, yeah, because it's, it is the most concentrated uh, wealth... Uh, car enthusiastic wealth group or whatever however we want to put those words together right the most right. rich car enthusiasts in one place anywhere in the world is here because that's also the focus of the, the, the show isn't focused on wealth but the cars that are focused on are the most expensive cars whereas like yeah. Tokyo Auto Salon could have some supercars but it's yeah. also here's everything for the year yeah. or LA or New York but this is like only unique, rare, expensive things with uh, the caveat that there's also like um, Concord de Lemons and stuff, which are really fun. I mean, yeah, and a ticket to get in is is $3,000. For quail. For quail. Yeah. So so that automatically eliminates, if you're not very rich or media or a somebody, you're not going. Yeah, that's a lot. So you end up with this very dense, it's 10,000 people. The parking lot itself of Quail is like the best cars and coffee you've ever been to in your life. Yeah, I saw a singer just parked next to a Celica. I, I just saw about 12 singers this weekend. Yeah, I saw one uh, parked on the street, which yeah. was very cool. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're all just, over they're, the place. They're just around. They're all over the place. And so, okay, so so yes, they're launching supercars there now, including Lamborghini, who launched the Temerario. 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 I think. Which is the their mainstream supercar. You know, that's like their now their entry level car. They launched it at Quail. Yeah. Um, so, you know, uh, it's 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 got a four liter V8 twin turbo electric motors, ten thousand RPM, and I hope it sounds good because honestly, its looks are a little. I don't know. Uninteresting. It, they're, it's more subtle, I think, than the Huracan. It's like a step, no, I don't want to say backwards, but a step towards subtlety, which for Lamborghini, it almost seems like because the power is so crazy, and the power yeah. is hypercar level, right? Yeah. It's like Revuelto level or whatever. It kind They kind of went, well, how do we make the, the buyers of the $900,000 car happy and right. not feel like they're getting shafted? Uh, kind of like 296 did SF90. So my, maybe they went, we pull back on the aesthetic. Because I think the aesthetic is super approachable. It has a little bit of that Countach thing they revisited. The, like the it, headlights the a little bit. Countach. A little yeah, bit of that. It does have a bit of that, um, yes. I think, it looks, I think it looks pretty good. It just, it is very subtle compared to all of their other offerings. Yeah, no, it's, it's nice. It just seems a little conservative, mm-hmm. you know, for a Lambo. Yeah. Then again, it's the entry-level Lambo, right? And they always sort of they'll 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 probably make it crazy throughout the you know they'll they'll make it more STO like mm-hmm. as time goes on I suppose um, but it does it's, it'll probably be cool to drive See? yeah I bet it'll be insane 900 horsepower um, that and, is wild. and Winkleman CEO of Lamborghini Stefan Winkleman is very much embracing 
hybridization, not even as a uh, as a step stool to full EV, but just as sort of the thing that their cars are going to be, which will be interesting. And in terms of the Revuelto, the one thing that the hybrid system really accomplishes is with an electric front drive paired to a gasoline rear drive, it eliminates this big gearbox and front drive shaft setup. Mm -hmm. So it does make the cabin much roomier, even though the car has a slightly smaller footprint, Got, which right. is cool. That is cool. Um, and welcome to Los Angeles, people. This is traffic. This is what we live in every day. This is why you have a Bentley and not a daily driver that's a race car. <laughs> um, so then you have, let's see, what else do we have that was there? The, the, the Tuttle uh, GT1. That kind of won the show, no pun intended. Like For me, it did. I, I think I saw more posts about that car on Instagram than any other car that was at Quail. It just, I think it, it's, I think it surprised everybody with what it was. It, I think it looks absolutely beautiful. I mean, the execution is flawless, basically. I mean, what sticks out to me is that it's a very clean design. Yeah. You know, yeah. the um, a lot of the other supercars and stuff can be very busy. True. Um, even if you, you know, like what, what like Singer is doing, their original design compared to like the DLS Turbo, mm -hmm. it has gotten a little busier. True. Whereas this, the lines are super, super clean. Yeah. And, and I love that. Yeah. And it seems very well thought out and considered. Um, and it, it, when he, when Richard opened up the clamshell and we were able to look at where the engine is, oh my and God. It's, yeah. it's very clean inside yeah. too. It's amazing. There's, well, it's all brand new. Like there's all the white ceramic yeah, the jet uh, hot exhaust and jet yeah. hot stuff, which look—I mean, it's pristine. It, I don't know if that engine has ran, but it looks stunning. And it's what cantilever suspension. Yes. I mean, it's it's race car stuff in the back. It said, I think the press release is like, oh, it's kind of based on a what nine nine three. But you're like, you look at it, you're like, the the back right. half of this is tube chassis yeah. race car. The front half is a nine nine three, yeah. sort of. Sort it's nine nine three architecture. And then the back half is tube frame and totally unique. The engine was, at least for this one, was a GT4 RS engine, although that's supposedly a chassis development engine, and he's oh. working on his own uh, water-cooled engine for this car. It's not an air-cooled car. That would that will also rev to 11, I think they said? I think it was 10. Oh, okay. It didn't go quite as high as the K okay. engine, uh, which I saw three 911 Ks at Pebble Beach. I didn't wow. know there were three. I didn't either. I but I was saw just the one. No, there's there's the gold one that's Philip's wow. car, and then there's the um, there's a, like a green one, and then there's a purple one. Wow. Yeah. Um, but I really liked that that GT1 design. I thought it was spectacular. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Gunther showed off their production turbo, which was gorgeous. Looks so good. And they said we can drive that car when it's when it's finished in a few weeks. And they also had the blue car, which is their new naturally aspirated car. Also looks stunning. And I yeah. like it had the like the vents at the back of the front fender that look really cool. Yeah. The wheel covers, I mean, it's kind of like that white like BBS rally wheel where it has a yeah. big plate to extract air. It just looks so good and such good color choices from them. Why do you, this thing is it's still telling me to get off. Um, I mean, is traffic that bad? I'm, I mean, we're not yeah, in a hurry, so I'm not. I don't want to do this whole thing of. I don't need to save five minutes by, by right. getting off and then get stressed at different left yeah. left turns. Uh, I just don't want to have to pay attention. Yeah. I'd rather do this podcast than pay attention. To yeah. The uh, there's an accident on the 405 South, so I, traffic will probably get worse. Will get worse. Probably, but uh, that accident. I'll cut this out of the show, so I can find it. Uh, in three miles, we will come to the accident, and then after that, it's green. Uh, road closed. That must road be. closed? No, no, no. That's I think that's Crenshaw. Okay. Hang yeah. On. I mean, it's gonna get dark red as we move forward. So. Oh, yeah, it probably wants you to take uh, Artesia to the 110. Ten. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's 
pretty green, so. I mean, it looks like it's like five minutes. <coughs> to what? It looks like it's like a five minute difference if we stay on this or not. Oh, okay. Right now, yeah, right now it says we're 12 minutes from the accident site. Yeah, so, so this, look, it's 103 if we get off or 105 if we stay on. Oh, that's, so really? Just, that's yeah. a two minute, okay. That's sometimes, yeah. like, I appreciate Waze's Waze-ness, but sometimes it's a little too much. Got right? it, all right. Um, so the Gunther, that's their new naturally aspirated car with a mm -hmm. four valve head. So that revs to nine, and it makes 500 horsepower. So great. And the coupe is lighter than the Speedster. Wow. Like, the new coupe is less than the current Speedster. Wait, 2,400 pounds. Because uh, they don't have to do re extra reinforcements for rigidity, I guess? I guess. Wow. Yeah, I guess. 2,400 pounds, that is so bonkers. Yeah. Man. So, and then we saw that, or I saw that uh, the Evoluto Ferrari also. I did which not is see that. The, which is Amjad, who used to work at <laughs> Gunther and went off to England to do this whole thing with the 355. Oh, that, I wish I'd seen that in person. It's yeah. very pretty. Yeah. It looks like it will probably drive nice. Uh, the detail work is excellent. However, the steering wheel was a little too small and, and didn't telescope or, or dish towards me enough. So mm. I would have had to to reach forward sort of right in between my knees to drive it. So just like a regular 355? It's kind, kind of surprising. Kind of, yeah. Considering everything else has been changed. Yeah, uh -huh. so they said they were working on that. But that was, I mean, without driving it, just sitting in it, that was my, my only real criticism was that that was not ergonomically what I would want for mm -hmm. that much money. But um, I'm sure it's a pretty easy thing to fix, um, you know, the, uh, the, the the size and shape of the steering wheel. Oh, yeah. And That's you can not... get, I was talking to uh, one of our friends about that 355 track car I drove. And, yeah. Like, I couldn't understand why they wouldn't do some sort of custom steering shaft considering the amount of money spent on the car and maybe it's just more complicated expensive etc but you can just get a really dished wheel yeah. and bring it bring the wheel like i don't know four inches closer to yeah. yourself which would be a lot better which is what i would do yeah um let's see what else what other uh was there i mean there was obviously the bugatti tourbillon the new bugatti which does look amazing in person yeah it looks great uh, it's smaller than i thought uh, and then they had the the bodywork removed from a Chiron, which yeah. was also next to it, which is really cool yeah. to see that carbon structure. That was rad. And you see how much engine that car is. Oh my God, it's the like, car is like all engine. Yeah. Um, Koenigsegg, what do they have? The G, the Yesco Attack. Yes. Which is the new version of the Yesco, which ran it, which did a 124 at Laguna on Ooh. Sunday, uh, beating the production car record set by the Senna. Uh, well, I, I read, I was looking up Zing, Singer stuff. Yeah. And they, Zinger. they beat, uh, and this was a year ago, they beat the Senna time by 2.2 seconds. Okay, so this was four seconds faster than the Senna. Whoa. So, yeah, the Senna did a 28, this was a 24. Wow. Yeah, which is real fast. That's bananas. Yeah. Because it was, uh, what, the 30th year of Koenigsegg, so they yeah. had, like, their anniversary party. So it's crazy I've to never think seen about. I do not think about it. Koenigsegg as a 30-year-old company at all. Uh, I mean, they yeah. are. No, no I, I think I first I first saw them on Top Gear, I think. It was like 2003? Yeah. Probably. But their so first they, ever car was like 90s. Yeah. yeah. So they've been around for yeah. a little bit. That's a car that also, one thing I really liked about them from the uh, in the beginning was that the design is very simple. Yeah. Like the GT1. It's very smooth, when, especially when, back then when you put it next to a Pagani, yeah. which has always had a lot of different They're bits busy. on it. It's busy. Yeah. Pagani's <clears throat> busy. I would say at the Quail, the Pag Pagani was the busiest stand by far all day. Mm. Um, and that could be because they're probably the cars that you're least likely to see around. Uh, the detail work on them is amazing. There was a lot of cars there. There was probably 10 Paganis on that stand. I saw one in the parking lot of Quail, like yeah. like around the corner. It was like it hadn't bought a ticket, yeah. so all its friends were at the show. I just it was in the corner by itself, away from nothing. Yeah, it was so funny. There was a bunch of Koenigseggs in the show too, at least seven or eight. And I saw, I mean, as every year as I go to Pebble, it shifts more and more from a show about old cars to a show about hypercars. Mm. And part of that is is the Quail itself. And the crowd that that draws, the, the hypercar consumer, mm -hmm. 
people are taking delivery of their hypercars at Pebble. Wow, I didn't uh, know that. Yeah, no, there were multiple, multiple brands delivering cars to customers at Pebble. One of my clients uh, at Westside took delivery of his Singer at Pebble. Wow. Um, and, and I think that's sort of a thing. Um, it was. And what, the Quail, there were some other older cars there. There was like the Groupie Rally section, which was that cool. That was cool. I mean, there was vintage supercar vintage also. Vintage supercar. There was some rad, like Diablo, that PlayStation Viper was really rad. Yeah. Um, there was a 550 Marinello race car, but it was built by, it wasn't built by ProDrive. It was one of the other competitors. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, you're right. For the most part, I mean, the stuff that I think drew the most attention was, you know, here is the buffet of hyper cars. Yeah. So, which I think is why, I mean, someone asked us, like, how do you go to Quail, or sorry, go to Car Week for free? I don't think people should feel compelled to go to Quail if they can't really, 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 really afford it. Because I saw, I was in traffic in front of a yellow Pagani. I saw multiple Koenigseggs driving around Monterey. Like, you'll see a lot of the stuff there out and about, yeah. which is shocking to say. Like, the purple Diablo that uh, John Tamarian and Curated sold yeah, was literally in front of me in traffic next to a orange uh, GT3 RS 4 Yeah. Like, so you can just, you can get really lucky and see a lot of the quail stuff Well, there's people around. lined up on Carmel Valley Road in the afternoon as you're leaving quail they're just there looking at stuff i mean and you can you can also you know let's let's forget forget quail for a minute but since you brought it up the best free things to do that week uh, for me the number one is watch the tour and the tour to elegance is is on thursday it's on uh it goes from pebble beach lodge all the way up 17 mile drive to route one and then it goes south to big sur and then back and people just post up and i usually go to the more sort of southern end of it um by where the u-turn is and uh but there's people the whole way every turnout you know they're on bixby bridge they're in the restaurants they're all over and you not only will see the actual concourse cars that drive by but like a bunch of other people you know take that as their opportunity to sort of like show off mm -hmm. um you know and and cruise up and down uh uh route one with a crowd because you can you know you can join the tour yeah like there are gaps between some of the, you know there are, at times yeah. there were very big gaps because there's a slow car that is struggling to go up a hill and suddenly there will be like no cars for 30 seconds and then another group of tour cars comes by. Well, the so, road's not closed. Right, no, that's what I'm saying. So it's funny, like, you'll see a Prius. Yeah. And it's someone going to work. And then you'll see a Delahaye. Yeah. <laughs> behind them. Yeah. Or, I mean, like, I'll, what I'll do is I'll, I'll start at the southern end. And after the first group of cars comes through, I'll move north. Mm -hmm. And I'll catch other groups. I'll, I'll do two or three different spots. That was so fun. That was so such a fun morning. That's, like, my favorite thing. And you can, like... You can picnic it. You can go early and get breakfast in Big Sur. You can you sort of post up lawn chair status. Um, you can make yourself kind of part of it by just driving on one during that time. Um, and so that's like, that's probably my favorite thing to do, free or, or expensive, the whole week. Um, and I do, I usually do it in a group, like Musto was there with me and my friend Ryan and Ali came with us and like, and we just, you were, obviously you were there and we, you know, that, that's the kind of thing that's fun to do with friends. Um, what else did I do that was free that was really nice? I mean, you can get into all of the auction previews. Um, it's not, it's not totally free, but it's cheap. You can get into the auction previews as a spectator for like 25 bucks. Oh, wow. So not free, but but certainly not cost prohibitive to get up close and personal with the auction cars. Uh, is Baja Cantina still free? Like, uh, yes, but parking is challenging. Yeah, I mean, so. that's, that's a pretty good time. Yeah. That's also Thursday's Baja Cantina? Uh, yes, I think so. I, think so. I didn't I, go to that. I went year. to the Avance party, which I don't know how much tickets cost because I was invited. But it was less of a car 
there were like three cars there. It's yeah. more of a social hang. It's yeah. a real, it was a great vibe and an awesome location. And the tacos out of the truck they had were super good. But that was more of a like low key event. You know, but Tim was there. Some fans were there. Um, but for car viewing, Baja Cantina kind of wins. Like you can go get I mean, food and then you can just watch the craziest shit rolling in. Or just have or any outdoor dining area in downtown Monterey near like the Portola Hotel totally on Friday or Saturday night will be a total shit show. Guys, just one more quick break to remind you that our TST merch is available at thesmokingtireshop.com. Get it while supplies last. And my collaboration with Notice Watches, The Canyon, does have a few units remaining at noticewatches.com. The beautiful blue colorway is there with the twinkly night sky motif. It's got uh, gilt hands and uh, gilt indices. Comes on an amazing Jubilee bracelet. It's two meters water resist it's a swiss movement it's an amazing piece i've been talking about it for over a year and you can get it in the night sky colorway now while supplies last and now let's get back to the podcast it'll be crazy well thursday i don't know how well you were staying downtown but thursday there was there was two blocks that had been closed off for a ferrari group and then next to it were two blocks closed off for like some supercar group so there were literally two different car shows happening like right around the corner from this great deli I went to, you can just walk around downtown Carmel or Monterey and you'll see stuff street parked, but you'll also see these shows that have kind of taken over the downtown areas. They weren't there, I guess, a few years ago. What was the best thing that you saw either street parked or it says, this says pile up in 400 feet. I can't wait to see what that means. I think means. it'll be, I think um, some flashes on the right. But uh, uh, the best thing I saw. Best like, thing you saw either street parked or or cruising around. Uh, I saw two Koenigseggs driving together. Okay. On Carmel oh, Valley yeah, Road. Look, there's a, there's a there's a, a truck crashing on the wall. Uh, I mean that was like I've literally never seen one in the wild yeah. moving before, and all of a sudden two of them go by me. Uh huh. And I also saw a. Uh, a six by six, which is terrible, but yeah. someone was driving one. And then a G-Wagon Landiole, oh, the, which is just ridiculous. Well, so there was a group of like three uh, six by sixes and then the Landiole. Right. And they were just cruising downtown Monterey together. They were just driving laps. And one uh, of them had a fake Dubai one plate on it. Oh, okay. um, <laughs> It was fairly embarrassing. That is very embarrassing. That, that's um, embarrassing because they're trying, they're doing an impression of something that no one here really knows about. Or cares or that cares much about. about. Um, I saw uh, I saw a 250 GTO driving in downtown Monterey. Was it the yellow? Talking, one? No, it was the dark blue. Jeez. Talking about 70 million. Um, I saw I posted on Instagram the Ferrari 456 Venice. Uh, post, oh yeah. Parked at my hotel, which was amazing. Um, our pal John Bothwell um, dailyed, drove, went from from Newport Beach where he lives to Monterey day lead his Rolls Royce Silver Ghost and drove it back. Oh, nice. Did a thousand miles and daily drove a Silver Ghost in Ron, which is so fucking cool. That's so comfortable. I thought you were going to say he did the, the Type 35, uh, no, which I mean, less look, comfortable. The Type 35 is awesome, but but in fairness, it's a replica. His Silver Ghost is real. Right. Yeah, true. Um, That's really cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I saw, uh, like, mo- I saw a, a real GT40 uh, on the street cruising um and i mean like like i'm not even mentioning the hyper cars because i saw so many like yes seeing koning zigs on the street is awesome but i saw so many that i stopped looking <laughs> um i mean and and if if i if i stopped looking at koning zigs and pagani's like imagine like the number of four five eights and oh, aventadors yeah. and fucking mclaren's and whatever was is so overwhelming that they don't even draw like for most people in our audience like the dopest car it's like when you're when someone is so amazing at high school sports and everyone tells them they're going to be a fucking superstar and then they get to like division 1 college and the whole fucking team is made up of the superstar from their high school and then you get to professional sports and the whole team is made of the superstar from the college you know what i mean 
It's like that. We're at the we're at the NBA, and it's all the superstars. Right, and and a three sixty is the the basketball player who was really good in high school, but never went on beyond that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's just it's so it's, well, you it's get, at such a high level. You get your brain gets saturated pretty quickly, and it it is funny to see like you know normal parking lots where you can tell it's like people are just finding a spot and they're going to go walk and look at expensive cars but next like with with the prius and the camry is a 360 yeah or is a 430 yeah because they're like oh i brought my car that i love so much but i'm going to go look at these other things yeah it's wild and at certain places high visibility places manufacturers are paying a ton of money to park cars up front like like multiple supercar makers you switch that to auto just yeah. yeah multiple supercar makers were paying a thousand dollars a day to have their cars parked up front in the valet circle at spanish wow. bay wow yeah wow yeah that's what that's amazing so i it's, mean it's crazy it is a wild scene in the whole week what, what i like is that there's so many different ways to do it and i don't think you can really do it wrong like you can see stuff for free you can spend all the money in the world and you can go drive or you can see cars being driven or you can just go see cars sitting still and you know parked up on a street or something like that yeah uh, or you can sit outside the entrance to the quail and the concourse and wait for me to come by and i'll give you my pass which i did to multiple people i gave my pass to the quail for a kit to a kid who was so nonchalant about putting it on his wrist and walking towards the entrance that the guards were like I saw I just saw you putting that on and kicked him out it was a total waste no of way yeah, yeah yeah wow uh, and shout out to the fan the fan who did it right Hannah and I were leaving the concourse and they and the guy came up to me with his girlfriend or wife he said I'm worth I'm a fan I listen to the show and and I know you've been here and this is my first time being here and you know, I'm on a, I'm on a budget. This was at fucking the the entrance to the concourse, and he goes he goes what are the what are the best things I can do for free right now? That is, that is a fucking textbook way to get me to give you my concourse pass. <laughs> textbook. It wasn't like hey Matt, I'm a fan. Can I have your pass? And, right. and I probably still would have. But if you want to make me think of giving you my pass, what are some free things I could do? right outside this crazy expensive thing that nobody can get into. That's so great. And we gave him and his lady our passes because uh, we left at like noon. I was I was so rushed to leave Quail to run to the airport, but some woman was like, can I can I use your pass? I would pay you. And I was like, I'm not going to sell something that yeah. I was given. Like, So I just gave it to her. No, it's like, it it's, it's your duty as someone who gets into those events to put your bracelet on a little loose so yeah. that you can take it off and give it to somebody on the way out. Yeah. There's and if you're so asking things. or getting a bracelet on the way out from somebody, it's your duty as a non-moron to put it on fucking on the sly. <laughs> not what? put it on. So did, could the kid not have just told the guard, like, oh, I was, I'm running late. I was just putting it on. Or did they see you, like, talk and then... Uh, I don't know. But, but Hannah looked oh back God. and the kid was being thrown out 30 seconds later. God, he was so close to glory. He was so close to the Young fucking Icarus. glory. Young yeah. Icarus. That's yeah. terrible. Um, the other thing, I mean, you know, Carmel is uh, hanging out in Carmel. There's always cars around. There's a huge car show in Carmel on, uh, let's see, this would have been on, thir- on Thursday after the tour. Because the tour ends in Carmel. Right, so in the morning the tour cars parked down that main road, Mm -hmm. and then in the afternoon there was like a big Ferrari show that took over the whole center of the town, and that was pretty cool. Um, And uh, you didn't you did not go to the historics, right? I didn't. Took the day off. I didn't. I love the historics, and and that's a thing that is really really fun to go to, and it's it's not free, but it's not super expensive uh, by Pebble Beach standards. Um, you can just buy a regular spectator ticket, which is, I, I, it's not its not nothing, but it's its a reasonable amount of money. And it is amazing to see those cars and, and see some real heavy hitter racing drivers running, yeah, you know? Yeah, true. But I was doing Spike's podcast, which was at the same time, so I couldn't make both happen. Um, but uh, the other thing was, um, you know, the, the, 
it, it's just it's also for me about like hanging out with people you know and, and seeing people and getting to talk to people and like at, at these events like pretty famous people are pretty approachable you know you can you can talk to Horatio Pagani and Christian von Koenigsegg and racing drivers I, you know I said hi to Emerson Fittipaldi you know like shit like that and that's that I think is a is a cool opportunity to like say hello to folks like that you know it's true I've been I, I know that at Quail at times I've seen like young people like a like a 20 year old or like a 17 year old who's parent bought them a ticket or whatever I realize how like expensive that is yeah. but they're very shy and they'll try to, they'll go up to like Horatio or someone like that and you can tell they're very shy they're like I'm obviously not going to buy a car I'm 16 but that's not obvious that's, that's actually a good point place. that's very not obvious well I guess their faces say I'm not going to buy a car but there are definitely 16 year olds there that could but all of the you know representatives or the OEMs or the, or the Paganis of the world are usually really gracious to talk to those people because they yeah. recognize like it's a pretty exciting day and the, you know the younger generation needs to be excited about cars, so you, should, you need to talk to these people too. I will say, the number of literal children that I saw driving cars that were half a million dollars or more was a lot. I mean, it was a lot, and uh, that's sort of like yikes, it's a big, big fucking yikes. Yeah, I did. I did the private jet tour. Uh, at Motorlux, just yeah. like it, you stand in line and you wait and you can walk onto a plane and look at it and yeah. I've never been on a private jet before but you know there are other people on the plane at the same time and I couldn't tell if they like me just wanted to see the inside of a private jet or if they were actually shopping for a Legit private jet customers right. yeah. yeah I mean I, I got one up from that not to literally one up but I got I got to go fly on one they were doing demo flights of the Honda jet the Honda jet that's so cool yeah and I have been on private jets before a, a number of times and it's what's really funny is like you know there's like levels of luxury right and like the Honda jet is luxurious in that it's your own plane it's very quiet which for a jet it's really nice they they have this very unique engine design where instead of the engines being mounted on the side of the fuselage like most jets they're mounted on the wings mm -hmm. like above the wings but separate from the fuselage. And that, it's really kind of weird looking, but that makes it um, much quieter. Oh, cool. Um, and it's also quite fuel efficient for a jet. And it's also quite fast. And they fly it at 43,000 feet. Whoa. So the air is smooth. Um, so it had a really good ride and it was very easy to have a conversation and, and whatever. And the seats were comfortable, but it's pretty small. Yeah. And so like, you know, this thing, the one I was on was $7 million, which is a crazy amount of money. Um, but even that, it, it's not necessarily luxurious in that, you know, it's not like you have all the room in the world. Like a first class seat on an airplane, like a commercial airplane will have like oh, more, wait, a lot more room. room. Yeah, I mean, particularly if we're talking about an international first-class seat. Well, it's like the, the Ford GT, the new one. You know, we had no space, but <laughs> yeah. it's expensive. Yeah. But it's got a purpose. And here we are in this old Bentley, and we've got tons of room. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it was it was nice. It accelerated uh, very fast. It landed very soft. The Wi-Fi on it was good enough that I was able to use FaceTime video, Whoa, FaceTime, impressive. which was pretty cool. I know they're starting to put Starlink on planes. Uh, which is very fast. Uh, yeah, they said this Wi-Fi you have to be over land for. Okay. So whatever it is, it's a it's some type of ground communication, not not up. But, How high uh, did you go? We only went to I think like twenty five thousand feet or so because it was like we flew like it was like thirty five minutes. You know, like you fly up, mm -hmm. you you do a you do a big big NASCAR loop around and then you right. and then you land. That's amazing. That's a pretty long flight, man. That's like San Jose to Burbank. Yeah, oh. it was, it was, and this, this, this was a, this, apparently this plane is good for the hour and a half flight. That's where it's really optimum. Okay. So it's the LA to San Francisco or, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and it sat five people and, and it was, it was comfortable, but it's not big. You yeah, know? it doesn't look big. It's, it's not like, big. It was like half the length of the other planes that were there. Yeah, it's not big. Um, but it's it's a car company that makes a plane, and that's pretty cool. Yes. Um, um, should we talk about Artura versus 750? Sure. Because you 
drove them back to back. Yeah, it, this was really interesting. Um, and and it, I, I had planned to drive the Artura the entire time, but at sort of the last minute, they were like, uh, oh, by the way, the Artura actually has to stay in San Francisco and the 750 needs to get back. So do you mind driving the 750 back? So, uh, so I only did about 700, 800 miles in the Artura instead of the 1100 I planned, but you know, that was enough. Um, you know, the big difference is 750 is a V8, uh, twin turbo, no hybrid system. And it's, it's older architecture, although it's a current gen car. And the McLaren, or the Artura is the new car. It's the twin turbo V6. It's a smaller displacement. It has the uh, hybrid motor uh, and a seven kilowatt hour battery pack. And it can drive on a bit of electricity, uh, but also the, the, the electric motor, which is inside the gearbox, does uh, quite a bit of work to fill in torque and smooth out the gear changes. And I would say that the two biggest differences between the well, three, there's the three biggest differences between the cars. One, the Artura is fast. The 750 is batshit fast. I mean, every McLaren is pretty much the fastest car you'll ever drive. Mm -hmm. But the Artura is real fast. The 750 is back at that level of you're getting wheel spin in fourth gear. The 750 feels, or sorry, uh, I haven't driven, no, when I drove the 765 and the 720, yeah. they both felt underreported massively. Yeah, yeah. Whereas the Artura, which we drove on a week ago, Monday, yeah. felt right on the money with the power number. I didn't sure. feel like I was getting more than they had advertised. And, right. And that's a pretty exciting difference for McLaren. The Artura is very fast and very fun, but it, it doesn't have the crazy that the other ones have. Yeah. The other ones are like, Jesus Christ, like, yeah. you know, they're, they're selling this to people? Uh, this is like so manic. Yeah, the, you know? the run towards red line as boost just gets stronger and stronger yeah. <clears throat> is so wild on those cars. And the, <clears throat> the sound, you know, the Artura makes a pleasant sound. It's a nice sounding car. But it doesn't have this magnificent snarl that the 7 Series cars have. Yeah, the... I, I don't know. The Artura was kind of a letdown to me in terms of sound. I think the 296 sounds better. And yeah. I didn't realize how much, like, Ferrari had done successfully with a V6 until driving the Artura. Right. Um, it's hard to make a V6 sound it's good. It's really hard. And, and, and I always think, like, smaller is better. Just make the sound tighter and smoother. Right. But the Artura was just kind of generic V6 sound, I think. And... and Whereas the 296 sounds a little bit like more musical. Yeah. And then, of course, the V8 is the V8. I mean, we know McLaren at Idle sounds yeah. awesome. The Bark is awesome. Overrun is cool. Yeah. Yeah. But so, so you've got the sound. You've got the, the crazy power. But the hybrid system is really helpful for changing the character of the gear changes. So, like, in comfort mode, the Artura's gearbox is so smooth and it's it's ridiculously smooth whereas there is almost there really isn't any way to make the 750 as smooth as the Artura yeah and and it should be said that the 750 and the 20 and stuff, like they don't shift slowly no no I it's mean, not about real speed quick. it's about just pure smoothness like the Artura with the torque fill mm -hmm. can be as smooth as like PDK whereas the 720 or 750 does not get that smooth in any setting. Yeah. It's more aggressive in all settings. Right, because you're like, you're in boost, in power band, you shift, yeah. you drop just slightly out of it. Yes. And then, like, I mean, the torque fill like fills in almost like a little pothole. Like yeah. it just fills it out and that is a flat moment. Yeah. So here's what's something that's really interesting about the Artura. If you don't tell the car otherwise, it, it can discharge the high voltage battery to zero meaning if you like you can manually toggle to in any of the modes for the battery to be in quote auto mm -hmm. or quote max right in any of the modes if you put in track mode it defaults to max okay 
but in comfort or sport, you can choose auto or 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 max, mm -hmm. right? Okay. So I was driving it in sport, and in sport, it holds it at about forty percent charge. It won't get below that. It'll go. It'll bounce between like forty and seventy percent, and sort of do its own thing. In comfort, it will use the battery until it gets to zero. And when it gets to zero, a light comes up on the dash that says, switch car to max charge mode. Mm. It doesn't even make the choice itself. Mm, that's weird. And what's weird is, when you, when you discharge that battery, you lose torque fill, and the transmission feels broken. Really? Like, not broken broken, but you... You, you don't have the torque fill smoothing out those gear changes, and it feels like the 750's gearbox, oh, okay. which is more harsher. Which, if you're used to these very smooth gear changes, and then all of a sudden they go away, it feels like something's wrong with the car. Wow, I'd have to experience that because anytime I've driven a McLaren, the shifts are still fast, where, so they feel smooth, like they didn't feel broken. It, it right. felt quick. And it felt... I mean, uh, broken the is the wrong so word because it doesn't feel traditionally broken, right? It changes gears, but the, but it feels substantially less smooth. You realize how much work you, yes. the hybrid system is doing. Yes. Got it. Okay. Yeah. When you take it away, you realize that it's it was there doing a thing. Okay. Um, and so actually... While I, I still prefer the 750, I think that's the best supercar on sale right now. It's just the greatest. It's absolutely the greatest. Particularly the 750 Spider, uh, Because you give up absolutely nothing for having a Spider. Um, but at the specific task of going on a very long road trip, and these were seven hour drives each way, mm -hmm. the Artur is better. It's smoother. It has radar cruise control. Oh, yeah. Uh, the comfort mode is a little more comfortable. Uh, the torque fill does make the gear changes a little smoother. Uh, at that specific task, the Artura, I think, was a little nicer. It's like as a grand touring... Well, I guess it would be as the as daily, a daily, daily as driven a daily, grand touring yeah. supercar. Which okay. is the goal of that car. That yep. car is supposed to be a daily drivable car. Uh, I also think the seats were really good in the Artura. I mean, they I, were. I drove the 720 Spider, I don't know, for a couple of days uh, in Colorado a few years ago, and and it it's, it was totally livable, and that was all fine. But the seats were kind of a letdown, and they were like like Ferrari. Sometimes if you get the the, the cheaper seats, seat, it's a very thin padding, yeah, and it's a little bit hard to sit on after like an hour. And yeah. the, um, the McLaren seats were kind of like that, but the Artura seats were really good. So. Yes, I agree with that, although this 750 had the comfort seats, and I do like those. Okay. But the Artura had the, they're called like the club sport seats, and they're a really good balance because they're a one-piece, uh, a one-piece, quote, bucket, but they're nicely padded, and they have adjustable lumbar, and so I do like that. And they do the rotation thing, so like they don't yeah. lean back like a traditional seat because there's no pivot point, Yeah. but if you hit this button basically rotates backwards so like the, the bottom of the seat tilts up and the back of your seat goes back a little bit yeah. it's only like i don't know 10 degrees but it definitely helps with the comfort and it's, i think it's a really clever solution to having a fixed bucket that you can change the the angle of hannah wanted me to say that she preferred driving the artura okay. hannah did a bunch of driving she drove halfway up and drove halfway home and she drove around town a bunch i had a lot of people that were like like, women were saying to Hannah, like, it's so great that you're driving the car. Like, none of these fucking men let their wives drive the car. And and they would say it to me, too. Like, wow. It's cool that she's driving. And I'm like, yeah, why wouldn't she be driving? And they're like, nobody lets their wife drive up here. And I'm like, I am not like that. I don't give, I don't give a fuck. I, yeah. I mean, that is a, I don't know, common trope, I guess, of the car yeah. world. And that's probably... I mean the the gener the age the average age of people who are participating in Pebble Beach we'll call it is probably older than us. Right. So they might have some uh, traditional values I, I, that we don't agree with. Probably yeah. true, but like people were 
very stoked that she was driving the cars. But she liked the Artura better. Okay. She found the 750 to be more intimidating, um, which I totally understand. Yeah. I think it. I think if you are not used to those types of cars, it is more intimidating. It's also, you know, it's wider outside the cockpit. There's like body out here, which she found a little disconcerting. Yeah. She thought it was harder to park. I could see that. Um, she liked both. She drove. She drove very aggressively in the 750. On the way home. <laughs> um, but uh, she liked the Artura better. She thought it was much more um, approachable. Okay. Which I agree with. She got. She got the hang of that car, you know, right away. Um, Did you ever drive it in EV mode? Uh, just to show it to a couple people and for the video. Right. And when I left for the for the video shoot, and I didn't want to wake Hannah up. Yeah. That's all I really use EV mode yeah. for. Um, but but I mean I I really I really liked both. I think they're both really nice cars, and I, I love driving McLarens. I love driving all McLarens. They just they drive they drive like I want a supercar to drive, like dynamically. They don't disappoint me in, like, any way. I totally agree. I completely agree. Um, but it, that, that was, it was, a, it was a wonderful trip. Um, we have a video uh, coming out. Po- I guess when this podcast will be out, that video is up of our, the, our, yes. our Tourist Spider review. It will. That, that vid- go check that out on the, uh, on the YouTubes. Uh, both Zach and I driving our Tourist Spider, and it's, it is a very nice car. I mean, we're... We're nitpicking a couple of little things that are secondary to the fact that it's fucking rad. Yeah, it's a um, nice thing to operate. But uh, what else did I have? Was there something else I had on my list of things I wanted to talk about? It was, it was uh, our stuff from Quail. The best cars we saw driving around the street. The best free things to do. That and those two. Oh, That's ridiculous. here's another one oh, yeah, I didn't add it. to the list. Unrelated to Pebble Beach at all. Fucking moving on. I get a text from our buddy Marco today, TLG Auto, mm-hmm. uh, one of the great air-cooled Porsche mechanics and, a, and one of my very good friends, and he is at one of his vendors that is one of the best shops in L.A. I, I wish I could plug him. I'm blanking on the name of it right now, unfortunately, but it's, it's the only place in L.A. to get a very high-end alternator, starter motor, or generator rebuilt. Okay. All right. Marco's up there picking up a client's part, and guess what he fucking finds? My alternator from my Countach was there. What? Was there. How? Why? Well, Donnie fucking dropped it off there a year ago. Did you know that it got dropped off? No. <laughs> but, like, let me, I mean, look, let me, let me Wait, tell you how something. Did, yeah, did Marco look up and go, I, I know that name on that tag, or? Uh, I, 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 didn't, I don't know exactly how he found it. He got talking to the guy... I think about Donnie because the guy did a lot of work for Donnie. Okay. He didn't know Donnie was in jail. Oh boy. And so he they started talking about Donnie, and the guy's like, "Donnie's in jail. Like, I, I, I have so a, many I have a whole bunch of stuff from Donnie." Oh god. And Marco said, "Hey, do you have, do you have Matt Farah's anything?" And the guy knew who he was. He's seen our videos and whatever. I don't I don't know if he's a quote fan, but like he knows who we are. Right. And he was like, yeah, I've got his alternator. <laughs> Donnie dropped it off a year ago. Oh, my God. So I, he, Marco sent me his number. The guy's very nice. His name is Coco. Uh, and I'm going to go up there next week and get my alternator, which he rebuilt my original alternator. And it's been there for a year. And, and I'm going to just pay him and go get it myself. I feel like this is the beginning of a very interesting Easter egg hunt that you're about to embark on. Well, so Damien from Franco's European Sports Cars, uh, they're they're in, in Van Nuys, and they're a family business, second generation, like Marco, second generation, uh, you know, and they're an Italian car specialist. They do Lambo and Ferrari. Uh, they really specialize in Diablos, but they do Countach also. And so when I get the powertrain back from Italy Frank, uh, Damien at Franco's, he's the owner now, Franco was his father, uh, that he's going to rebuild the car. And so he just went down to my shop to inventory what was there. 
and he hasn't called me about it yet. We have tons of time. I mean, my engine probably won't even come back until December or maybe January. Right. So we have all the time in the world to figure out this shit. Um, but let me tell you about a game that I won't be good at. Here's a completely disassembled car strewn about a shop. Yeah. Tell me what's missing. Tell me what this is. I can't fucking do that. This I, is like where, where's Waldo inverse, where it's like, where would Waldo be? We, we erased him from <laughs> yeah, the page. Yeah. But where where's the gap? <laughs> exactly. Oh, my God. So I didn't know my starter motor or my alternator, like, wasn't there. I know, I obviously, if you show me a fucking alternator and go, what's this? I know what an alternator yeah. looks like. But I, I didn't uh -oh. I didn't know that it wasn't in this pile of stuff. And so, anyway, we found my alternator. Yeah. Uh, oh, man. And I don't know what I hope what that's it... the only thing that's missing. Oh, there's definitely something. I know. I mean, look, the big optimistic. one was the heads. Yeah. Right? The big one was the cylinder heads, which were at a machine shop and fortunately had not been touched yet. And I was able to just go get them. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like... This is like a weird... Like a video game where you have to build the engine and you keep hitting the start button and it's like engine not ready. Like, yeah. Why? It's like part missing. Yeah. But they're not going to tell you which part is yeah. missing. Your heads are gone. Yeah. Your starter motor is gone. So Boy. that's kind of fucking crazy, huh? Um, speaking of crazy, to go back to Pebble real quick, I got to ride in the Hoonigan RS200 Escort. Oh, yeah, because our, our homie purchased it. Our friend purchased it and another friend who I was staying with up there was like minding it and yeah. was going to bring and brought it to different events and things. So on the morning of the tour, we were going to drive it down to meet you for breakfast. And we drove it for about eight minutes. Yeah. And uh, race clutches are very difficult. I didn't drive it. Our friend drove it. But that thing, it weighs like 2,300 pounds. It's like 700 horsepower. Yeah. It is so tiny. And, and from the outside, you go, okay, this is a Hoonigan car. It's Ken Block's car. Isn't this thing amazing? And then I got to sit in the driver's seat. And you can't believe that he drove this car at all. Well, he couldn't. That's why he got rid of it. it and I understand why. Yeah. Because when you press the clutch, your foot is touching the dead pedal zone and the brake yeah. pedal at the same time. Yeah. You have to take your shoe off. And even with your shoe off, you, there is so much thought that has to go into where your foot is going so that you don't hit clutch and brake at the same time. And meanwhile, the dead pedal area is like eight inches across. I yeah. mean, it's part fender, but like... The thing, and, and there's also a lot of room between the brake pedal and the gas. Like, it's like, why is the brake pedal creeping on the clutch? It needs to, it needs to give a little bit of space. It's like, this is a Ford. Why does it have Ferrari ergonomics? Yeah, it was really shocking. Um, but that's, you know, the two reasons Ken sold it. Uh, one was it was too valuable to really hoon. Mm -hmm. He couldn't, even though he was rich as fuck, he couldn't mentally wrap his head around that. And he wasn't a collector, he was a driver. Right. And then also, he didn't fucking fit in it. Oh, yeah. Also, it's... Our friend Ali is not... Like, I'm taller than him. Yeah. And he gets in and he goes, the seat's all the way back. And I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. Yeah. Because he's up here like this, yeah. with his knees touching the wheel. And behind him is firewall and, and like, relays. Yeah. There's no way to move it back. I don't know how Ken even got in the car. I think he like, drove it, like, twice, yeah. honestly. It was so compromised from that, which is so, which is so disappointing. Yeah. But... When we got it on the road, for the brief two minutes where the clutch wasn't slipping, because it started to do that, this thing lights up all four tires yeah. at 30% throttle. Yeah. It is absolutely alarming. Well, remember, so this cool. was the fastest accelerating car of all time for about 25 years. Uh, I mean, this was the first car to ever do zero to 60 in the twos. Uh, yeah, but I think this has more power than they had back then. Yeah, yeah. This has... 700 horsepower and they used to have like in rally stage trim like 600 Six. yeah so yeah. they've put they've turned this up even more it is it is nuts yeah it is so nuts um and it's like you know it's it's all wheel drive but it doesn't have we should all appreciate e-diffs so much more <laughs> like the lucid right 1200 yeah. horsepower we floor it it goes fairly straight yeah. until that 80 mile per hour mark where it does a little bit of wheel spin this thing at like 25 when you start dipping into the throttle and boost hits just starts walking left and right up up the road because it doesn't it's sending power to all the wheels yeah. and they're all just like start doing a burnout it was it was crazy and I, it, for a moment i was disappointed that we had to turn around and then i thought you know what it's probably a better you know idea what? we might die i think i had the the most you can experience safely on a public road in that thing speaking of very uncomfortable uh there was a i put the photo on my instagram 
but Philip insisted I sit in the strata oh, zero. Yeah. And I was like, no. And he's like, yes. And I was like, absolutely not. And he's like, absolutely yes. And Hannah was like, absolutely yes. And so I go to, you know, the windshield opens, right? And you climb yeah. in through the windshield. It's the cool. steering wheel bends out of the way like a BMW I set up. That's so awesome. And, you know, there's one of these. This is it. This is the only one. And he goes, okay, you put your foot here and you, did, and you like fall. And I'm wearing a suit, you know, so it's not like I'm maximally flexible, you know, anyway. Yeah. But um, if there was a fire, I'm dying in that car. I'm not getting out in time. Well, you like bonked your head I because you're head. too tall to yeah. sit back into it, I yeah. think. And, and I didn't post the picture, but I should show you of when he closed the, the windshield. And you can't see me. You just see two knees <laughs> up on the windshield. It's so fun. And then, you know, obviously I'm doing the fat guy in a little car. An enormous crowd forms. Everybody's filming me. I mean, it must have been 50 people. And everyone's filming. And they, Philip opens the fucking thing again. And I look up and I have, like, a panic attack. And someone's going to post a video on Instagram. And you're just going to see me go, stop filming me. <laughs> Close the door. Close the door till everybody leaves. Turn away. I can't do it. I think, I hope that most of them were filming because they were just like, oh, yeah, how do you get in and out of this crazy I, spaceship? I don't think anybody was ill-intentioned, but yeah. I could I could not handle I get it. all of these people filming me about to do the most awkward thing I could possibly do. Yeah, it's weird. It's like, And then he won two trophies. Yeah, it's a, such an amazing looking car. Yeah. Oh, my God. But it's like, it's like climbing out of a like a cellar in Oklahoma. It's like the door is almost flat. Well, like, you want to talk about a fucking tastemaker. This guy enters, there's, there, there was a, the wedge class, yeah. right? But the wedge class was actually divided into two classes. And I don't, I, I don't remember what separated them. What, I don't remember the exact difference in the classes, but there were two wedge classes. Okay. Might have been a date or something like that, but he fucking won both. <laughs> the Strato Zero won one of them, and the Aston Bulldog won the other well, one. What else was in the competition? With I mean, those are the wedgiest things. I mean, the Zero is well. A there wedge. was there was the 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 low tech Mercedes thing that I, the curated brought. That is such a gorgeous looking car. It's crazy. That is one of the most beautiful front ends I think yeah. on any supercar. It's not, and I've never seen one in person. Well, I think they only oh, made my, like three. It's stunning. Um, and then there was that uh, Honda concept car, which was really cool. That was very cool. Um, there was, uh, oh man, there was a, there was like a jet car, a turbine car from like like the Motorama era. Whoa. There was a, a, a Chrysler concept car, some Chrysler sort of Gia concept car, and, and a few other uh, other things. Um, there was a lot. There was that Ford Probe that unfortunately burned oh, yeah. in the trailer. How on like the trip? Like two it, days ago, it was did? displayed on the lawn. I know that. And it burnt. The trailer caught on fire on 17 mile drive, leaving it. The whole thing burned to the ground. Oh my god! I, mean, I did not know that. Very sad. Wow. But also, like in a way, kind of beautiful. That like this car's last day existing was like on the lawn at Pebble Beach. It like it reached yeah. it reached the mountain top. I get it. Yeah, that's and true. And then was like, "Fuck it, I'm out." It's all downhill from yeah, here. Yeah. Okay. All right. Man, that's uh, that was uh, Matt Hardigree's favorite car of the show. Yeah. I just remember he was yeah, like, they "I filmed, love this thing." They filmed a thing for Autopian with it, and then it lit itself on fire. It was also Hannah's favorite car, which is why I had a picture of it. Wow. And I was like, "Take a picture of this." Um. So, I it was it was other than the car catching on fire, it was a great great uh time it's it's always a lot i was so tired yeah. i slept probably 10 hours uh uh when i got home and i slept i slept halfway home in the mclaren when hannah was driving i slept the entire way yeah and uh and then i slept like 10 hours my voice is still fucked but it's just it's so nice to see people and hannah said one of the things that she found so interesting you know she doesn't she cares about a car, you know, if a car looks cool, she's like, wow, that looks cool. And she likes, you know, she likes seeing some, some of the weird stuff and whatever. But she said, like, what was her favorite thing was, like, seeing all these people that, like, know so much about cars and, like, enjoying their hobby together. 
you know, and like, and that was like a really nice thing. I think that's true. You know, and and so all the all the journalists and all all the the people who are you know bringing stuff to display but and like whatever the judges and the people yeah. that uh, the restoration folks. I mean, the people that just know everything. Yeah, it's cool to watch them talk. Hannah had like a twenty minute conversation about hot dogs with the CEO of McLaren. <laughs> <laughs> he was, he's so bored of talking about McLarens. That's, that's he was really he was uh, he. Shout out to Nick Brown. He was so nice to Hannah, and was was happy to talk about hot dogs with her for twenty minutes. <laughs> um, uh, I, uh, no, you know what? I'm not going to say that. I don't want to get in trouble. Yeah, I, I, someone else told me something else that would be a real juicy piece of fucking gossip, but I really don't think I want to say it. All right. Um, Better safe than sorry. Tell, but, uh, tell me when we take I'll our tell break. You, I'll tell you later. Yeah. But, uh, I, uh, you know, shout out to uh, to McLaren for uh, setting me up for the week because that, that was very nice of them. And and I assure you, I, we still gave as honest a review of the Artura Spider as I possibly could. And, and yeah. same with all their cars. But it was, it was very I love the people that, that work there. And so it's very nice uh, to, uh, to, to sit down with them at, at dinners and stuff and talk about them and talk about their cars with them and you know really really I mean literally tell the people at the very top of the company what your experience with the car is as mm-hmm. opposed to you know telling the audience or, or making a video or whatever it's really a a treat to be able to tell the CEO you know here's what I loved and and here's what we could use some work on and and we were talking me and Michael Leiters who's the global CEO Nick Brown is the North American CEO we talked to, I talked with Michael Leiters about about the allocate about the uh, the addiction to allocations oh. as he was talking about why why German guys why do people buy these cars they don't even want them and it's like well you you know you want to buy the next one and you get hooked on allocations totally. right I just put up a new video a comedy thing I did with Michael Gideon about uh, the Porsche ST allocation oh really yeah I just put it on Instagram okay. and the response was so fast everyone's like yup like here's my story oh, or okay. here's my friend's story or yes like why is this the world we live in like you gotta buy these other things yeah. before you can buy the one you actually want okay so those watching the video may notice we've gotten off the highway and we have to make a stop, Zach. Yeah. On the way to the Volvo launch, we have to make a stop because because <laughs> I have bought a car. <laughs> I'm laughing. I mean, you know, like Matt tells me he bought a car yesterday, and I start laughing like I am. And I was like, anytime Matt has ever said I'm done buying cars for a while, my bullshit meter goes right. off, and I'm like, it's just a matter of time. And we're here. Yeah. This is this is this is where. Now, we're not taking delivery of a car. Right. What I'm doing right now is putting a deposit, 50% deposit, on a car. And so we're going to go inside, and I'm going to hand over a check. And uh, and then we will come back uh, we'll after, the the, Q&A. after these minutes. And it will be like I never left. But we will, be, we will do the Q&A for the last half hour to our press launch in Newport. When we get back in the car, you're going to be poorer. I will. But I'll be getting into a Bentley. (laughs) So not that much poorer. (laughs) All right. These are questions from our Patreon members. Uh, If you want to join our Patreon, go to patreon.com slash the smoking tire podcast. Get uh, episodes early, episodes ad free, and watch episodes live. All right. First, Dan M says, car week question. Are BMW kids the junior lamb bros. Yes. I mean, they're not always kids. There's definitely some BMW adults that are doing those types of driving. I mean, it's like, it's the Burble 2 yep. Nationals, right? Yeah. That's what it's, it's about how much noise can your car make while not going very fast? Yeah, and I would say that that behavior is, I don't see Ferraris doing that very often. It's Lambos, yeah. it's BMWs, and then yeah. I mean, uh, uh, sometimes G- McLaren's. G37s. But yeah, that's true. Like, yeah, that's true. There is there is some McLarening. Yeah. By the way, like sidebar, if you are watching the video version of this podcast and you know where we just were, don't ruin it for everybody. I'll just stay on this camera. Yeah. Until we leave. So, cause it, but some people <clears throat> will be able to figure that out. But like, don't ruin it for everybody. That's all I'm saying. Keep, um, it, keep it fun. 
because we're going to have a big reveal eventually. Well, because, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's exciting. It's, it's a new car, but, like, you don't know what it is. Right. They don't. Just say it. Uh, Michael Cosgrove, as someone with experience driving Laguna Seca, what are our thoughts on the Koenigsegg Jesko attack setting the record? Is it simply a factor of horsepower, or is this a fully fleshed-out performance car? That is a fleshed-out... I mean, it's a fleshed-out performance car as far as, like, one lap goes. I mean, I don't know what happens on lap 30. Right. You know, it might heat-soak like crazy. It probably doesn't, but... Um, and I'm guessing it, whatever power settings it had were probably turned up to kill. But, like, you don't do a 24 without being able to stop and turn right. like it's supposed to. I mean, the, the Senna is fully fleshed out, to yeah. use his term. And so that set the time it set with, you know, nearly 800 horsepower. Yeah. You're not going to beat that with straight line speed alone if the car isn't pretty good at corners and braking also. I mean, right. if, if you put a car there that has 1,800 horsepower and can hook up, like, there's not that many long straightaways at Laguna. I mean, there's this, the main one, and then uphill after five, like, power yeah. could be deployed there. But so much of it is is long sweepers where you carry momentum. Yeah, so it's you need a lot of grip. Yes. Um, a, it is a flushed car, but for sure. dude, like, I, I ran, uh, I think when I was in the Evora... Uh, I ran a 41. I think I did a. I think I did a 40 in the CT5 V Blackwing. This is 16 seconds faster than that in one lap. I mean, and those are like quick cars. And I'm mm-hmm. like a pretty, pretty decent driver. But like to go 16 seconds faster than that in one lap is a ton. Yes. Um. So yeah, I mean that's 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 a. That's a very impressive number. Yeah. Uh, but also, oh. the Valkyrie AMR Pro. Oh, yeah. With me as a passenger, on the medium power setting, did a 118. And, that's, <laughs> and that has like a 1,000 horsepower, but weighs nothing. And is... Yeah. And has what more a lot more aerodynamic downforce. Yeah. Jeez, that is wild. I don't think... I don't know if the Valkyrie street car would do much better than the Koenigsegg, if anything. And in fact, some people that are in the know told me that you really shouldn't take the Valkyrie street car to a track day, because it would be pretty sketchy. It's like not for that, um, but yeah. I think I, I think it's probably a downforce thing there, right? I yeah. Mean, I mean, you can only get tires that are so wide. The power, they're all making over a thousand, so that doesn't really matter. Yeah. But the downforce just increases your cornering speed. Uh, Timbo says, uh, Matt, um, are there events that you and Hannah would both enjoy if they were easy to travel to, like Goodwood, like other car stuff, if you could travel there in an instant, and, you know? Um, I mean, look, Hannah, you know, doesn't care that much about the nerdy car stuff. She likes talking to the people. She likes... You know, she likes hanging out with with friends, and so Pebble Beach is nice because there's other there's there's great restaurants, there's interesting people to see, there's a variety of things, and I've been so many times that I don't force myself to go to every single thing. We we went to Ali's house and made pizzas one night. I mean. You know, I think that was probably the, her favorite part of the whole week was hanging out with Ali's family and making fucking pizzas. Um, so, um, you know, I wouldn't, I probably wouldn't take her to an F1 race. Mm-hmm. You know, she could, she, she might enjoy Goodwood Festival of Speed. I mean, that's, that's a, a, enough action uh, and enough people watching and enough culture in one place, I think, that, that she would have fun. You know, she doesn't like road rallies because she doesn't like driving fast on windy roads. Um, and she doesn't particularly care about racing. Um, but I, I, as far as, like, car stuff to take Hannah to, it doesn't get much better than, than Pebble Beach, I think. Mm, okay. 
Uh, Christian says, I'm 28 and I have zero interest in old cars. When I'm in my 50s, am I going to be enjoying 991 Speedsters, Huracans, etc.? Did we like old cars when we were young? Uh, I mean, not really. I mean, the cars that I liked when I was 5 to 15 are the cars that I'm most enthusiastic about now. Mm -hmm. So I think it depends on what Christian is into or was into when he was 5 to 15. Right. I think it also has something to do with, or a little bit to do with, for me, the fact that exotic cars were much, much rarer, you know, than then, than now. I mean, I would see, when I was a kid, I would see a Lamborghini as often as I see a Pagani or a Koenigsegg now. True. Yeah, you very know? true. Uh, I mean, yes, there were more Countaches built than Koenigseggs. But on a year-by-year -year basis, not many more. Mm -hmm. You know, Koenigsegg builds 50 cars a year. Lamborghini was doing 100 cars a year. I mean, it wasn't like it wasn't like 50 to 2,000 or 5,000 or 10,000 right, right. like they are now. So, so those cars were a much much rarer sight. But to the to to that person's point, I think yeah, the stuff you were you know into as a kid you continue to be into which you can see in the cycles of the collector car market what what gains and and loses popularity for the most part is people aging into their spending years and buying the stuff they wanted as a kid and then people sort of aging out either dying or getting too old to drive the cars anymore and then they sort of drop in value mm -hmm. you know um the stuff that's super, super hot right now, the Ferrari F40 and F50, Diablos, um, early Paganis, pre-merger Mercedes. I mean, those are people in their 30s, 40s, and 50s buying that stuff. And yeah. So they were kids when that stuff was new. Yeah. So, yeah, I think those will eventually fade away. Um, all right. Uh, Miguel Flores, what is the pettiest feature of a car that if it has it, you'll refuse to own it. For him, if there is a parking brake foot pedal instead of a parking brake grab handle, he'll never own it. Uh, I don't know if petty is the right word, but like, what's a deal breaker? Yeah. Hmm. Haptic buttons. Um, particularly haptic buttons on a steering wheel. Yeah, I think there's a there's a maximum volume I would permit. Mm -hmm. Like the Golf R is an amazing vehicle over like overall, and if the haptic buttons were only on the HVAC stuff, I could probably live with it if I can control things with the steering wheel normally. But like, you know, not that I have the money, but like a two nine six or a Roma or any you know any yeah. of those right now, it's just nothing but haptic buttons, and it makes every interaction with the car, other than steering, difficult. Yeah. Um... Yeah, I, a CVT. I would not buy any car with a CVT transmission. I agree with that. Uh, those are really the only two. I mean, Landau top. That's not. They're not putting up putting <laughs> on my new cars. Out. But I, even if I wanted an old car, I yeah. I think they're the dumbest things in the world. They are. But Magnus and Hannah got their 1985 Rolls Royce. It's like this, but it's the Rolls. Yeah. No turbo, but very similar. Uh, and the vinyl roof. It it has a Landau roof, and it would not be my choice. But they got it for so cheap that I can't hate. Okay, I, I don't know. I mean, they had it. On, they put that on muscle cars and stuff like yeah, the vinyl. I didn't get those. Looks bad. Even it when it's new, and then it, it ages quickly. Yeah, yeah. It does look very bad. I don't know if that's petty, but I hate it. How about this? And there, there's an asterisk on it, but a deal breaker would be. A paddle shifted transmission from 1995 to 2008. Oh, all the way to 08. Yeah, like until a paddle shifted gearbox that wasn't a dual clutch. So no and LFA. The, ooh, ooh, maybe maybe the one exception would be the LFA, but 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 I would if it was a Ferrari, I would swap. You know, I would do a manual swap. So I'm not saying I wouldn't buy. An F1 car. No, no, yeah, but we're let's say live with. Like, like, you no, would, yeah, you would no, keep no it. single clutch, semi-automated. I don't think boxes. I could do it. Yeah, I, I've driven a couple of them, and it's trash. such a disappointment, and just takes so much out of the car. Yeah, they're trash. Yeah. 
Uh, all right, Terrence King says, how long could you drive an Alpine A110 in the States on dealer tags before violating federal law? One year. You could, you could bring a car, an, Al, an Alpine A110, presuming that it was legally registered in its home country. You could get a Carnet, which is a tourist visa for a piece of equipment. And that piece of equipment could be a, a computer, a camera, a, a, a boat, or a car. It's, it's, a, it's a visa, and they last a year. And so you could ship one to America, drive on it. You wouldn't have to put a dealer tag on it. You could drive on it on its French tags or whatever for a year, and then it would have to go. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, Jeremy Costco says, if one were traveling to Monterey from Los Angeles, which route would you suggest for a car enthusiast to take? Uh, Highway 25. If you want to have a fun drive, yeah. you can take the 101 and then jump over to Highway 25, and it's in the middle of, it's a valley surrounded by mountains, that's how valley works. But there's no one out there, and it's twisty, and it's great, and there's no service stations or anything, so fuel up beforehand. But that is, that's the special way to go. I mean, I would, I would still say if it's open, if you can get all the way through, there are no landslides or closures, you know, PCH through Big Sur is spectacular. That's true. And, you know, one of my fa very favorite drives it, I did my Ferrari 328, it was uh, two years ago, Pebble, and I got up at 4 a.m. I left L.A. at 4 a.m., and I, you know, at, at 4 a.m., there are no laws in L.A. You can fucking, you can drive 100 miles an hour, no problem, nobody gives a fuck. And in an old black Ferrari, nobody will see you anyway. A tiny little car like that. And I blasted, I, I, got, to I got to the base of PCH in San Simeon in like two and a half hours. I was there at 6.30 a.m. Because the, the key is you wanna be on PCH before the people with the RVs get up. Mm -hmm. So I was there at, I was there at 6.30 and I did, I did that, I did hit PCH. It was about, it's about 90 minutes on PCH and I stopped in Big Sur and got breakfast, some coffee, and then I did the rest of it. I mean, the 25 is great, and it, it is a great, great road. And even if I took PCH up, I'd probably take the 25 back. That would, that would be the road trip. Mm -hmm. Do one in one direction and one in the other. Because when we drove PCH in the morning to watch the tour, mm -hmm. like, the water is so many different colors down there. I mean, it, it is one of the most beautiful places. It's so gorgeous. Yeah. And, and people act, I, I find actually that people have generally pretty good canyon etiquette on PCH better than they do in other places. They get out of the way. Yeah, so if, if that's open, that's how I would go. The 101 to, to, to PCH. You know what I think? PCH has the element regarding canyon etiquette where if someone's going slowly and they want to take in the atmosphere, it, they don't want to feel rushed, yeah. so they'll let you buy because they're like, you can just go ahead, I want to go look, I want to look at the seals and the, yeah. and the whales and everything. And there's lots of places to stop on PCH to take pictures and stuff like, it's so pretty, but yeah, it's closed right now. And so a couple of my clients who are driving up from the shop asked about what's what's the route and I sent them up the 25 and they emailed me and they were like, that was sick, which is, it is very, yeah. very sick. Uh, Troy, I feel like we sort of addressed your question, but it says, it seems, it seems as though Gen Z prefers newer enthusiast cars to antiques. Do we see this changing the nature and attendance of events such as the Concours? Yeah, I think they're, that's why we're seeing more hypercars, supercars. There's, like, more new car, let's call it new car events that happen there. Yeah. Either whether it's whether it's cars on the lawn or it's cars around that week, or sorry, yeah. events happening that week. There's a lot more attractions for people that are into new stuff than there was, I don't know, 10, especially 20 years ago. Totally. And, the and you know, Instagram and car spotters and Instagram influencers mm -hmm. and... You know, very new money buyers have a lot to do with that. You know, very new money buyers aren't buying Ferrari Lusos and Muras. They're buying, you know, Paganis and Koenigseggs and Aventadors and stuff like that. Yeah. Part of that is because they want stuff they can reliably drive. You know, stuff with air conditioning and, and whatever. But part of it is that's what they saw when they were six yeah. years old and they yeah. thought it was cool. Yeah, that too. 
Um, Colin S. says, uh, a lot of headlines and enthusiasts focus on the negative of new cars, such as they're heavy, they're, there's no manual transmission, etc. What are some of the positive steps the automotive market is making for enthusiast cars? Uh, well, new Bentleys have nice cup holders, and this has none. Well, they also handle really this, well, yeah. which is incredible. This car has five ashtrays and zero cup holders. Um, which, uh, I mean, look, new cars are safe. They're efficient, you know, turbocharging, which was uh, originally per performance and then adapted for fuel economy, also had the side benefit of increasing performance exponentially very, very quickly. Same with hybrid systems. Yeah. We have these hybrid performance systems. I think there's also more attention to driver feedback or handling than there was maybe 20 years ago. Like the mm -hmm. fact that Mercedes, and now steering feedback is a different thing. It depends on the system. but. AMGs from the early 2000s were fast, but weren't the most f exciting things to drive. Right. The transmissions were terrible. And so now, like, more of those cars in that class have, I think there's more overlap in how they feel from, like, BMW, Audi, Mercedes, stuff like that. Right. Um, and you can, you can, like, change things. You can change how a car feels to make it suit you. You can adjust. Yeah. You can dial oh, yeah. in. I mean, even on a, on a Hyundai, you can dial in your suspension, your steering feel, your brake feel, your shift points. I mean, you can you can tailor a car to suit how you want to drive and suit and tailor it to suit multiple ways for how you want to drive. And Absolutely. That's cool. Yeah. Um, Sean Fisher asks, which OEM do we think will be the first to create a PHEV that becomes an icon in the enthusiast community? Could be different OEMs based on separate niches, We're uh, going. driving styles uh, of the community. Uh, oh, and man, did we make it? That was a long yellow, but I didn't think our old school brakes <laughs> would work on that light. That's fair. We we made I mean, it. Um, well, a PHEV. So La Ferrari's trade for double their MSRP. Porsche 918s trade for 50% over their MSRP. So the there's the question's already been answered. I mean, the Porsche and Ferrari, and, and I think P1s. I think P1s trade for over their MSRP as well. They, so yeah, they definitely do. So I, I I think all three of those cars. I mean, granted, that's a you know these are very expensive cars. They're millions or multi millions of dollars, but still enthusiast cars, still still hybrid, plug in hybrids, and uh, and so it it has been done. Yeah. Um, Martin Swanson asks, have we noticed more Hummer EVs now that the Cybertruck is out? And does the Cybertruck make the Hummer EV look better? In San Diego, he sees them equally. E I've sorry, definitely equal seen fruits. more. I'm, I'm starting to see some around, mm -hmm. particularly the SUV, yeah. which I think is better looking and a little better proportioned than the truck, which looks awkwardly long. Yeah, I only I only saw one in the wild at Car Week, and I drove by a Chevy dealership recently that had uh, like eight of them on the lot, yeah. which I was I think I don't know it'd be speculation. I just know they had a lot of um, issues with the Ultium stuff, and yeah. so deliveries were delayed a lot. So it's possible that people cancel their orders, but they seem to be less popular than Cybertrucks. Uh, yeah, I definitely I see probably twenty percent as many Hummers as Cybertrucks. Maybe I think we saw maybe even 10%. Four Cybertrucks on this drive on the way down. Yeah. And I haven't seen a Hummer. So. I, see, I see between five and 10 Cybertrucks a day. Yeah. So, um, and when you start no. seeing that many, boy, do you realize how dumb they are. Yeah. And when they stop so being, wow, that's unique. And they're so big. Yeah, they're dumb. Yeah. Uh, uh, Chappie asks, uh, he recently borrowed a friend's Outback. Really liked it, but it had a dumb CVT in it. Um, why would someone, why did Subaru go with a CVT rather than a decent automatic? It's just, it's just efficiency. I think it might be more fuel efficient. It is. Yeah. It is. It allows the engine in the car to find the exact perfect ratio to maximize fuel efficiency at all times, at all speeds. Yeah. And it's just a math question. But yeah, they're, they're not fun. And my mom has an Outback and it has a CVT in it. You know what she's never once mentioned about her Outback? The fucking CVT. She does not... You know, my mom and uh, it, it, people, if people like us, Subaru has decided that our opinion is not important. True. We, we're not buying those types of cars. Right. And if we are, we're going to meet them where they're at. They don't need to come to us. Yeah. 
we've we've done that math a whole bunch with yeah. Subaru, and they'd rather sell Foresters to our parents than STIs to us. And uh, I'm trying to recall from when Sarah and I were shopping for cars and we went to the Subi dealership, but at the time they didn't have any hybrids on sale. Like they have to do everything they can to maximize the fuel efficiency with the systems they have. Yeah. Because they all have full time. Like, look, here's a Crosstrek. Like they all have full time all wheel drive. The end, the Boxster engine. Um, I don't, they don't have that many turbocharged ones. So they have to use all the tricks in the tool bag There's a that Hummer will help EV. them. Oh shit. Uh, that will help them be as efficient as possible. And one of those things is going to be CVT. Um, Anthony L says, you have, have $200,000 to buy a car that fits your life at this moment. What do you choose? I mean, if you, that's a lot of money. I think I would get the last gen GTS with a manual. Sure. That's a good one. Uh, yeah, a 911 would be would be really delightful, I think. But if I was buying a new car right now, it wouldn't be a sports car. It would be, it would be a daily. So I probably would get like a Panamera Turbo Hybrid Wagon Sport Turismo. That would be all right. Mm -hmm. A little GT3 behind us there and GT Silver Touring. Um, Ryan asks, what's our take on the Rivology cars? So... Full disclosure, uh, I store their press fleet cars at Westside. So even though they don't pay me to talk about them, they do pay me to park them every month. Uh, I am, although I haven't driven one yet, other than around the block, I'm very impressed with the build quality. Uh, the door slam on them is like a fucking G-Wagon. I've never been around or seen any muscle car with a tighter door slam than that Revology car. Um, we're gonna make a film with one as soon as we get a manual. Yeah. They have, we for the last four months, we've been storing their, their demo cars and both have been automatics. And so as soon as we have a manual to film, um, which they keep telling me is coming, uh, we will film it. But the quality, uh, just from having them around, moving them around, driving them to the gas station, it seems top notch. So, um, I like them. Nice. Um, Ivan Capote asks, what cars from this generation of 2010s and up do we think will be on the lawn at Pebble? Not because they add value, but because they're cool. This is tough because I think the lawn cars tend to be very rare. And like, like cool cars today, like your Boxer Spider is awesome, but they're making thousands of no, them, right? No, it's, it's coach built stuff. Yeah. It's those... Those one-off Ferraris that they build for like Eric Clapton, like SP3. Yeah, well, SP3, but also the 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 Ferrari, like whatever it is, Special Wishes, where they they'll take a a four five eight and make it look like a five twelve boxer, like that kind of stuff. Right. The Rolls Rolls Royce Boat Tail, like they made like Jay Z bought one. You know, it's 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 that coach building stuff um, that that I think would be really what we, which is yeah which is by the way the stuff that you see on the lawn from like the gilded era totally that's coach built shit too yeah you know or even from the 50s it's not a you're not seeing a chrysler 300 you're seeing the chrysler gia concept and they built four right so, right it has to be something like that yeah. um look at this here's newport we're driving a bentley to richie rich land that's, that, that's why we saw the Hummer. We're down here. Because we're in Richie Richland. Um, sure. Chris Navio asked, were yes. there any cars you saw at auction that were att attractive to you? Yes. Hannah very much wanted us to bid on a BMW Isetta 600. Oh, cool. Which is the Isetta that has the back seat. That would have been It's not fun. the two-door. I would say two-door, but it's, it's a three-door. So it has the one front opening and then it has regular doors in the back and a regular back seat. Okay. And um, we didn't bid on it. I, I, we, we once we once I fell in love with this other car, that was sort of moot. Um, but we did make a new friend at Pebble that has three Isetta six hundreds, and he says that we are more than welcome to come to his place and roll around in one of those. Nice. Which. I think that's 
kind of where I'm at. I don't think I want to own an i7 right. 600. You want to have a day in one. I want to have a day in one. Yeah. Yes. In, uh, a, in a nice place with good weather. One of the employees of Cars and Bids owns a 2CV, and I was like, oh, I, yeah. I wrote on the Instagram, I was like, I want to drive that thing. And they emailed me, like, come drive it. It's like, that's, I want one day. Yeah. I don't want to own the thing. Um, all right, we'll speed run these. Uh, Alejandro says, what are good brands of car covers for a car that's being stored not in direct sunlight? What do you use at? Uh, I mean, California car covers good, but they're expensive. Covercraft is pretty good, too. Um, you know, you want something soft. It's like if it's stored indoors, it should feel like a, like a Lululemon fleece. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's what we use. Uh, Jay Fritz, you get to interview any person dead or alive during a drive in any car. What combo would you choose? Oh. Enzo Ferrari and an F40. Ooh. Or Enzo, Enzo Ferrari in like a, you know, like a, maybe a, like a 250 GTO. Something that like he was really, really involved in, really hands on, you know? I think I would go with Dan Gurney. Oh. Mm. And maybe in la, like a McLaren F1 or T50. Mm. Well, he probably rode in a McLaren F1, so maybe I don't know something like T50. I wouldn't pick him up in a in a <laughs> Italian car. Um, we did that one, and oh, last one. With high-end watches like AP, Patek, Rolex, making complications for the sake of complications, how have they not made a watch with a built-in GPS tracker? Since theft is a possibility. There's no such thing as a mechanical GPS tracker. That's like not a thing. Right, it has to be electronic. Yeah. Did they not come with that built in? Maybe that's what he's talking about. Uh, I mean, repeat the most useless thing. I think, I think, that, I think it defeats the purpose. Think we can self park or should I valet? I don't Either way, know. that's our show. We're here. We're driving electric Volvos. And uh, thank you to all our patrons for their excellent questions. I think I'll just valet. And uh, we'll see you all later. Bye.